Hello, everyone. This is Mike from the All Together Academy, a training ground for awareness loving life, where together we thrive, and that is what it is all about. I am going to answer a question from a client in the Mojo Maker program. Um, this client, um, this participant, asked me some questions via email while participating in the program and attempting to use and activate the tools that, that we are learning um, to not just um, thrive, but also to heal. I'm opening up my email here to look at her questions. is like, how do I actually use the, the change state tools, the emotional tools? Like when I'm in a situation, when I'm in a situation that is live, that is dynamic, that is related to either a partner or a conver or an immediate conversation or a situation at work. Um, and, and so she says, she says, I know they're great tools, but how do I turn the, the tools into a plan of action. What do I actually do into the moment? Understanding into practice. I have hammers and screwdrivers and saws, but I don't know when I should use them or what materials go together. Um, you know, she, and she makes a really good point that is much more complex than the physical tools. You know, the stuff that we're learning about walking and sleeping and breathing, et cetera. It's much more complex when we're talking about an actual live situation and maybe how that you know, interacts with another human being and then how that relates to maybe our own trauma or whatever multiple factors that can actually be coming to play in, our, in an alive situation. Um, and, then, and then the next part of the question is, um, how do I spot it if I'm not always aware that it's happening, right? And that's, and that's, that's also great too. So, I, I prepared a little bit of a response that I want to share with you all. So the, for those of you that are watching the recording, for the one of you that is here live, um, I can't emphasize enough how all of the things that we're learning, even though I know that there's a lot to learn, but how all of the things are, even if they seem indirect to a live situation, say an argument with a spouse or a difficulty at work or something like that, how all of the things are actually directly related because we don't really have a fighting chance when we're really triggered, when something is up and something is alive to really catch ourselves, to change our state, to come from a more resourceful state, to be more, um, to be more, to be more skillful in the way we handle a difficult situation. If we aren't cultivating the tools when things are not as difficult. And, and the common analogy here is one that, that, that I'm familiar with in my life, which is sports, but I think it relates to anyone. I think people can relate to it, is you wouldn't expect to be able to perform in a difficult game, in a big match, if you hadn't practiced. And so the tools, the regular use of the tools, like you know the, the daily application of just doing some breath work or doing yoga nidra or getting enough sleep or drinking it drinking the right amounts of water or going for a walk or so whatever it is, all these different things that we're suggesting in this program, these are practice. The real game, the real match is when we are in a difficult situation in our life, when we are challenged, when we need to apply the skill. And the skill is, the skill is awareness. The skill is the ability to change our state. The skill is the ability to turn off the alarm switch switch and turn on the thriving mode. The skill is the ability to um, come from our icon of our essential self to be who we choose to be and, and to be a creative influence on the situation instead of just the knee-jerk reaction. The knee-jerk reactions, the autopilot of our being is, 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 a, is, is a learned, learned behaviors, learned ways of thinking, feeling, and acting that have accumulated throughout our entire life. And now we're trying to go into be a creative human being that is choosing how they respond to a situation instead of reacting the way we always have. And that takes work, that takes effort, that takes skill, that takes practice. So all of the, while, while this person is asking very poignant and important and relevant questions, I am 
also returning to the foundational pieces as essential to be able to do what she's asking how to do. Okay, so once that is once that is clearly known and established and say like, this is the thing that I do in the morning when things are calm, uh, when nothing really is up or wrong in my life or there's no challenges, absolutely make it possible to do it when things are really hard and when things are really challenging. And without that kind of regular cultivation, that daily consistent regular cultivation, just like we wouldn't expect to be able to perform well when there's thousands of people in the audience or we're at the Olympics, you know, Olympic athletes aren't going to nail their routine if they haven't been practicing for a year. Well, when we have a really tough or difficult situation with a spouse or a boss or something like that, or where our, or we have um, issues that have triggered past traumas or something like that it, and triggering parts of our nervous system that are very young that, that were wounded when we were very when we were very young, then we don't really have a uh, we don't really have a fighting chance if we're not doing this ongoing cultivation that I'm suggesting. So that's there very deliberately as the first priority. It's not as it's not as sexy. It's not as glamorous. It doesn't maybe seem always so relevant to the direct things that we're dealing with in our life, and we want to we want to be able to put out the fire. And, you know, but this is the longevity game that we're playing here is that we're building a foundation so that we can have a first story, a second story, a third story, and even a balcony that overlooks the beach. Well, you can't have any of those um, beautiful things. You can't have any of those um, skillful things if you don't have a solid foundation. Okay. So that's one. Point number two is... Um, now, what do you do when <laughs> you really do want to implement these things that we're learning in this program into an alive situation when it is difficult? That also requires the practice of the, the tool, the lesson and the tool that we're talking about in terms of the neurochemical roadmap to the future, creating that icon of our essential self, which is, which is, is basically having enough road time, thinking, feeling, and acting, and actually even mentally rehearsing how we would respond if we were in our ideal frame of mind to a difficult situation. And I was reminded of the power of this in, when I was watching actually the Olympics and I was watching Eileen Gu. She's a snowboarder, skier, et cetera. I'm not sure if, you, if you're familiar but what I was, I was seeing her before she would go off on a run, uh, she won the, before she did her gold medal run, a couple of things happened. One, the competition was such that, um, that in her, in her final run in this one snowboarding competition, she needed to do something that she had not prepared for because she knew that what she had planned to do was not difficult enough to get the score that she needed to get a gold medal. So in her final run, she completely improv improvised. And of course, she maybe has done this stuff in practice before, but she did a, a different routine than she had originally planned to do. And it was really cool to watch her at the top of the run. And she and, and you, as, if, as I was kind of studying her, I could see her and she was doing like this. And you could see her eyes moving and you could see her like moving her body and twisting a little bit and doing this a little bit of that. And then all of a sudden she went boom and she lit up and what she was doing. And then she took off and she nailed the run and she won the gold medal. But what she was doing there is that she was actually rehearsing in her mind what she was going to do on the jump and including that she wasn't getting it right every single time in her mind because she was, she was imagining, oh, maybe missed it, oh, missed it, missed it. And then there was a moment when she nailed the jump in her mind, that is when she took off, okay? And so the body does not know the difference between neurological, neurochemical experience, sensations in our body, does not know the difference between stuff that we powerfully mentally rehearse and things that 
happen in our outer outer reality. And I'll give a really powerful example of this that is a little bit <laughs> that is a little bit funny, or maybe sometimes people are like, "Oh, that's kind of a weird example," but it really seals it home because uh, because if if you've ever had the experience, particularly if you're a male, which is the experience that I can speak of um, personally, particularly if you're a male and you're a teenager and um, and you're sound asleep and you're not moving and there's no one else there and there's no physical contact either with yourself or with another human being and you have a dream about sex and your body literally mobilizes the energy that could create another life by having what is called a nocturnal admission, a wet dream more colloquially, and you literally ejaculate from only from mental activity. So our bodies actually produce the full physiological response that could create another life based on thought alone. And that is what we, were do we are doing in the neurochemical roadmap to the future, is we are creating an infrastructure to mentally rehearse over and over and over again, but not just mentally, not just positive thinking, but actually, how would I feel? What would my posture be like? How would I move? How would I respond in any given situation? How do I breathe? How do I stand? What do I look like? What is my felt sensation, and we're doing this over and over and over again so that we mentally rehearse to such a degree that we embody the changes of who we value and choose to be. The future that we wish to create, that we wish to experience more of, we are bringing it into our present by literally embodying it, by acting now as if that future was already real. And, and that, that is like <laughs> really, 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 really cool stuff. And so to see someone like Eileen Gu doing that, oh, 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 then go, boom, I got it. So, so that's one thing to this person's question. She's dealing with some particular situations that I'm not going to share here, but when you're in before, you know, when you know that those situations are coming, you can, one, prepare for them by getting yourself grounded, getting yourself centered, asking yourself, how would my icon of my essential self meet this situation? How would I think? How would I respond? Mentally rehearse, you know, you're probably, even in the mental rehearsal, will get triggered, even in the thinking about the situation, and you might even get upset or angry just thinking about the situation. Well, that you want to rewire that. You want to say, okay, well, the, well then this is what I'll do. And that is what I'll do. And, and I'll say this and I'll say that. And it's never going to, it's not that the live situation is going to go exactly the way you rehearse it. That's not the expectation. But what you're doing is you are preparing yourself. You're making, you're creating a, the possibility for one, you're going to have, if you do this, you're going to have much more awareness in the situation when the red flags are going to go off, when you've done that neurological roadmap to the future, that neurochemical roadmap to the future, and all of the ways that are not your icon of your essential self are going to start happening, and you're going to notice them. And so that's one of our questions. How do I know if it's not happening? Well, exactly right. You can't do anything about it if you're not aware. If you don't show up and be like, oh, this is happening, I'm reacting, or I'm triggered, or whatever it is, you're not going to know if that I, that noticer, doesn't pop up. And we're not just, if we're in that automatic, autopilot, reactive mode, there's no possible way that we can do anything different until we become aware in the situation. And the thing about emotional reactivity is that it actually is designed to shut down the thinking part of the brain. Why is that? Because if a tiger is coming in the room and it's about to bite my throat, I am literally designed to shut off the thinking part of my brain so that I will act immediately. So if I'm in survival mode, it actually diminishes the capacity of my prefrontal lobe to think clearly, to plan, to strategize, to do the most skillful thing, to choose differently, because it wants me to react and react immediately. 
and think later. If I walk by a branch that my brain thinks maybe that's a snake, it wants me to jump and then look at it and say, oh, it was just a branch. It wants me to react immediately, not think, and then get space, get away, get out of danger, and then think about the situation. Oh, oh okay, yeah, now I can reevaluate. So we have to know that if we are in survival mode, that is the state that we are going to be in. We are, we're, we're in that state with our spouses. We're in that state with our friends. We're in that state with our clients, our bosses, our colleagues, et cetera. Well, when we're in survival mode, we're treating them like they're a poisonous snake. And there we are, we are fighting, running away and hiding from the situations, fight, flight, and freeze. And we're doing that instinctually and reactively unless we show up and say, oh, maybe, maybe there's a more skillful way to handle this situation. Maybe there, so that takes awareness. And that awareness is also like a muscle, which is why we practice meditation. <laughs> you know, we don't just practice meditation just for the fun of it. Although, you know, it might feel really peaceful and joyful in the moment when we start to get really used to it and cultivate it but we're also practicing it because it's like a muscle. The more awareness muscle that I have, the more likely I am going to not get caught and trip or triggered by those situations that appear to be a snake. And we're gonna be like, oh no, uh, if it is a snake, I can make a the most skillful move away from it. But if it isn't, I don't overreact to it. I don't treat the branch like it's a snake. And then, project onto the branch. Hey, you snake, you made me, you made me angry. You made me afraid. And this is the, you know, I'm using that analogy, but this is the stuff that we do with the people that we love and it, things spiral out of control really quickly as we know. Okay. So how would my icon of essential self think, feel, and act? If you can ask yourself that question, asking questions activates the prefrontal lobe. It activates the the that human part of the brain um, and so that automatically is going to give us a little space and a little distance from the emotional reactivity which is the animal and the reptilian brain the, ma the mammalian and the reptilian brain so asking questions is key what would my eye what would my icon of my essential self bring to the situation what would how can i mix into the situation the values that i choose and so Every situation, I want us to learn to think about every situation like a recipe. It is a recipe made up of ingredients. So if I'm in, in a, say, in an argument, well, the, there are already some ingredients. Maybe the other person is bringing some ingredients of anger, or, you know, and then my reactivity is bringing some ingredients of fear. Well, then how do I consciously and creatively mix new ingredients into the situation? How do I mix new ingredients of what I value and choose to have more of into the, into the recipe so that I start to change the flavor of the situation. And so how do I first inject awareness into it? Then how do I inject some openness, some curiosity, some questions into it? How do I consider other possibilities? Well, if I've gone through that neurological roadmap to the future, now I have a hundred things. Well, I know that when I'm, when I'm really experiencing the icon of my essential self and I have that energy signature, I know what that feels like. I know how I stand. You know, I, I don't, I'm not like this or like this. I know I'm like this. I know, I know how I, uh, I know how I breathe. I take full breaths. I know how I think. I know how I consider other alternatives. And so I can start to mix in those new ingredients into the situation and it doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to necessarily create a whole new dish if I use that analogy, but I'm in charge of what my input is into the situation. Now, um, some situations are harder than others. <laughs> some situations are much harder than others. And so the next thing I wanted to teach you is about the three zones of activation. And so you have zone one, and that is rest and relaxation. Okay. And then you have zone two, and that is challenge. And we've already talked about the challenge mindset and opportunity. And then you have zone three, and that is overwhelm. And so 
if we are in overwhelm, if we are, if the situation is over, overwhelming us and we are reactive or triggered to a point where we are in fight, flight, or freeze, and there's, and we're not able to change state, we're not able to get ourselves in a more resourceful state, we are better off getting space from that situation. Now, remember, if we're in fight, flight, or freeze, if we're in survival mode, our brain thinks that we're in danger. The animal brain is really very simple. One of the most effective things that we can do is put ourselves in a new environment. The changing of environment sends a message like, oh, the danger was there. And now it's, I'm, I'm in a new environment. Now, of course, we could go to the new environment and start thinking about that situation and reactivate it all over again. But hopefully we're going to have more skill than that. We're going to use some tools when we get in that new environment. But going for, you know, sometimes we need to go for a walk. Sometimes getting fresh air, these things that we know that are kind of like colloquial, just good general sense or advice, we now have a neurological understanding of how effective and why they can be so effective. Like sometimes just walking around the house, going to the bathroom, say you're at work and, you know, and you're in the middle of a heated situation and you can't, you can't really, you know, leave for a long period of time. Well, it's pretty much accepted that you can say, hey, I, I need to use the restroom. Go to the bathroom, splash cold water in your face, sit on the stall, lock the stall and do fog breathing for a minute or two. Like get yourself, remove yourself from the situation that your brain has identified as dangerous. Get away from that snake, whether it's a branch or a snake doesn't matter. If you're not able to realize that it's just a branch in the moment, get yourself some space, get yourself some perspective, use some of the tools in a different location. Okay, that's really important. Sometimes it's more than that. Sometimes we need to sleep on the situation. Sometimes we need to go for a drive. Sometimes we need to, you know, there is almost nothing in any of our lives that is so urgent that we need to deal with it right now. Now, the other person might not like this if we're talking about a relationship here or, or a relating dynamic. The other person might feel triggered or offended that we, you know, that we, but so, but hopefully, if these people are regular people in our lives, we can educate them about this concept beforehand and say, look, if the situation is overwhelming, I'm going to do this. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ask that we revisit the conversation the next day or something like that. And they might not like that, but if they understand that the value is, is that the reason why you're doing is that is, is actually because you want the relationship to thrive because you want to be in a more resourceful state because you don't want to bring this survival mode to the situation you want to do your part to be you know as skillful as you can possibly be because you appreciate and respect the person not because you're trying to avoid them not because you're trying to invalidate their upset in the moment not because you're trying but, but you're just willing to admit and acknowledge like for whatever reason no blame, no fame, not blaming you, not blaming me, but like the situation is more than I can handle right now. That's really skillful thing to do. We all have these types of situations in our life. And if we can, if we can communicate in a moment that is not intense, that is not triggered to our partners, like, hey, I just, I just want to let you know that the reason why I'm going to do this sometimes is because I want us to succeed, because I want our friendship to be you know, a good one because I want our marriage to thrive. I don't want to be in a situation where it is almost inevitable that we're going to hurt each other more. So I am going to use these new tools that I'm learning, this new perspective that I'm learning. And I want you to know that when I do, it's not because I'm abandoning you or running away from you or trying to avoid the situation. It's because I am getting myself in the best possible situation and state so that I can respect you and your difficulties in our relationship and make it the most likely chance for it to thrive. And, and, and so I find that couples really respond to that type of, okay, yeah, even in the moment they're triggered, but if they've had the conversation previous to the difficult situations, they're much more easily able to tolerate a partner being like, you know, 
I'm overwhelmed. I need to leave this. I need to walk away. I need to go for a walk. I need to take a shower. I need to go to sleep. I need to go for a ride, whatever it may be. Okay. So, so remember these zones. If we want to grow, if we want to, if you're, if you're really interested in fast tracking your growth, we're going to be in zone two, which is the challenge zone. You know, challenge means 85% of the time I succeed in this, 15% of the time I fail. So challenge means it's not always easy. Challenge means like I'm on my growing edge, but I'm within the ability to have success with it most of the time, not all of the time. If I'm in the rest and relaxation zone, that's important to have, spend time there to recharge our batteries, et cetera. But that is where we want to spend most of our life, hopefully, is challenge in rest and relaxation. If the more we spend in rest and relaxation, we might not grow so much. The more we spend in challenge, we will grow. We will grow a lot. But in one of those two places, but if I'm in the overwhelm zone, zone three, we have one, two, three. If I'm in the overwhelm zone, that's counterproductive. That's counterproductive to my personal growth. It's counterproductive to my relationship growth. So that's a really good time to actually go all the way back to the rest and relaxation zone so that I can now reassess the situation and come back to the situation with more vitality and more energy, more skill and more resources and more tools so that I can now come back to the same situation as a challenge instead of as an overwhelming threat. So these are the, these are the different, these are the different, um, ways of working with these specific situations. So, all right, that's what I prepared for today. <laughs> I know that that was a mouthful, but now that that is recorded and we'll even have a transcription of it, that, that hopefully will help some of you for how do you actually activate these things in the moment in difficult situations. I invite questions either from you, Anuj, that you're here on the call right now, or from anyone else that watches the recording. Um, so I will open it up for that. Any points that need to be clarified? Okay. 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 Oh, that was really good. It made sense. It made total, total sense. Cool. Cool. So, so yeah. And, and, and again, I will, I, will, I will circle back to the point that I was making at the beginning. The ability to do all that successfully is predicated upon the stuff that seems indirect, the stuff that seems not particularly relevant of cultivating those things. You know, the better you feel, we change, as, as, I, as you'll hear me say often, we change better by feeling better. The better you feel, the more likely you are to succeed with those tools in difficult moments. And that's common sense in certain environments. You know, we don't expect to really nail the presentation at the board meeting if we haven't, if we don't really know our stuff, you know, and, and so, but we don't always apply that same logic and that same theory to these things, you know, with our kids, you know, really, you know, oh, well, I'm more likely to, you know, be patient with my kid when they're acting really annoying if I've done breath work that morning, <laughs> you know, it's, it's simple. It makes sense when we hear it, but we don't think about it sometimes in the, in the parts of our life that are actually most important. We, we, we think about it oftentimes at work, or maybe if we, if we're into sports, we would think about it. Oh yeah, that makes sense in that environment. But what about practicing and training so that you can be the best human that you can be in the context of relating to the situations that are the most important situations in your life with your loved ones, with your family, with your career, um, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of, uh, that's uh, my story and I'm sticking to it. 